Welcome to the Workology Podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader. Join host Jessica Miller Merrill, founder of Workology.com, as she sits down and gets to the bottom of trends, tools, and case studies for the business leader, HR, and recruiting professional who is tired of the status quo. Now here's Jessica with this episode of Workology. Tech is especially hot when it comes to human resources, recruiting, and the workplace. As even more companies, including possibly yours, look to adding, updating, or changing their existing HR and workplace technology. It's hard to know where to start, especially since there are literally thousands of new and budding HR technologies, as well as more established and experienced brands and products to choose from. But even before we talk about products, we need to set the bar and discuss about the return on investment that these technologies can bring to your business and workplace teams. I'm joined by Jason Averbuck. He's the CEO and co-founder of LeapGen. Jason, welcome to the Workology Podcast. Jessica, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background for for those, and and there are probably not that many that aren't familiar with you and kind of your history in the human resources space. Yeah, so Jessica, I've, uh, you know, just like all of our parents, uh, you know, they raised me to be in HR. Ha ha. No, just kidding. Uh, My parents, you know, have this really interesting background of my mom was a teacher and my dad was a business executive. And I, at an early age, fell in love with technology. And, you know, that I was introduced into the HR technology space um, while I started my career at a company called Ceridian Corporation, which, as you know, is still out there, you know, doing implementation of payroll services. And I said, wow, what I get to do in this world is uh, work with technology, which I loved, work in the business world and try to understand business better and combine that with education and teaching. And uh, from that day, I was hooked in the whole world of HR and workforce technology and uh, have spent the last 25 years in it ever since. So uh, great, great kind of blend for me and you know, combines my passions of business technology and teaching. Well, I I think you are in the right spot because we are on this, we're on this path right now where technology in our space is changing. It needs to be updated and, and people need more information and resources and training around how to use it, how to apply it, which is kind of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's from Ceridian Corporation, I went on to PeopleSoft, from PeopleSoft, went on to form a consulting firm called Knowledge Infusion, went on to be the CEO of the Marcus Buckingham Company, and now with LeapJet. You know, the the changes uh, come fast and furious. And, you know, it would be great to talk today about what those changes mean and where we've been really good in some cases at, at adopting and adapting those to ourselves to those changes. And where other cases we've kind of like, the changes happened and we kind of just said, eh, yeah, we'll kind of do it and we kind of won't. So look forward to the conversation. Well, let's get started and let's kind of talk about maybe workplace leaders. I know that their HR and recruiting technologies need an update. And I think that most who are listening are shaking their heads saying, yes, we need to update our HR tech. We've been thinking about it. But where do people start? And then where should they look at in terms of determining the return on investment for this type of tech? Yeah. So Jessica, I think that HR tech not only needs a refresh, the name needs to be changed. And what I talk about all the time is that we're really dealing with workforce technology, not HR technology. So if I say HR technology, that's technology for who? The HR department. And what I'm really dealing with in today's world is technology for the workforce that the HR department can benefit from. So whether it's thinking with that different lens about the technology is not for me anymore. I can benefit from pushing out this technology or whether it's cre- I'm creating a business case. And the last thing that CEOs want to spend money on is more technology for HR. What they want to do is spend more money on how to get the most out of my people and most out of my talent from a business standpoint. And by using a different label, instead of technology for HR, I'm using technology for the workforce. That makes a huge difference when it comes to the business impact and business case. I love that. You're just kind of shifting your thought process a little bit because managers and, and well, senior executive leaders, they're already there. They want to invest in talent. So you're talking about technology for talent, for that workforce. Yeah, exactly. And Jessica, where the refresh is needed is, you know, up until the last you know five to seven years, I haven't been able to target my business processes 
at managers and employees because they didn't have my tools. Uh, you know, I didn't, they didn't have, I didn't pu push out disks to them. I didn't push out CD-ROMs to them. You know, the invent of cloud and cloud technology where all I need is to be able to connect to the internet and have access to these tools, that's new. So the biggest difference, Jessica, is that the audience is completely different. We've moved from where my audience was my HR department to where my audience is now the entire workforce, the employees and the managers. And by shifting from a transaction for the employees and managers to an interaction where the employees and managers are interacting with these tools, interacting with my processes and data that benefit them, I get an immediate benefit back as an HR professional who's trying to use this data to make strategic decisions. I like that. And that's the place where the ROI really comes into play because you have access to all these interactions, right? So you can make better informed decisions and then interweave that technology within those conversations and engagements and tools that things that are being used. Yeah, Jessica, one of my big problems with HR technology is we go through HR technology in a series of campaigns. And HR or workforce technology needs to be seen as an always on perpetual beta, continuous improvement initiative, where the value until I'm live, I'm live with the tool and I'm using the tool. But what a lot of organizations do is they have their best people on the quote unquote implementation. All of a sudden they're live and you know, we have a big go live party, everyone's gained 20 or 30 pounds, you know, all that stuff that goes into a go live party. We've got balloons. And then I take my best people and I shift them off the project. You know, my go live party should really be my go begin party. That's when I begin to get data and start to get the benefit out of these systems. Yet I spend all my time and money on the getting to live. Uh, we, in the world we live in today, I have to think more on the other side, which is sustainment, innovation, and optimization than just on the getting live part. I'm scribbling down notes because, and I'm also thinking about my husband who works in healthcare technology, and they'll have their go live party like you're describing, but the real work is after that go live because it's the ongoing training, the conversations, the data that's coming in. Um, for him, it's the the patient information with the the different folks who are maybe nurses or doctors, um, not that different because it's the manager conversations, the employees who are using the technology, and then the data that's coming back from that so we can make more informed decisions. Yeah, and we're just scratching the surface. I mean, if we think about where artificial intelligence is taking us, you know, the more data we have, the better data we have, the better capability the machines are going to have to help us interpret that data and make decisions on it. So, you know, every single day we have to think about and look at our digital footprints and say, today is better than yesterday and tomorrow's going to be better than today. Every day it gets better. And to do that, I need to shift my focus away from just the implementation and really focus on the sustainment and how do I keep watering this tree to make it smarter, better, stronger over time. That it's a huge mindset shift, just like the difference between HR and the employee. Another big mindset shift is let's not just focus on the go live, let's focus on sustainment. How do HR leaders who are overseeing the the shift and this change go from the sort of more transactional to the more sustainable long term? Because you're mentioning artificial intelligence and, and really how these engagements are infinite. Uh, that kind of seems overwhelming. It is. And I, I think it is overwhelming unless you, the mindset is that I have a strategy in place. And my strategy is a two to three year strategy, not in ink, but in henna. So I have a henna tattoo, you know, and what a henna allows me to do is it allows me to get rid of it after a couple of weeks and start over. So another thing, Jessica, that's really important around, you know, how do we, how do we deal with all of this is we, we have to think about the world we lived in the past. So we take 18 to 24 months putting in these big systems. And if we missed the mark, you know, it was a big miss and, you know, sometimes career limiting move to switching to this world we live in today, which needs to be thought of as a perpetual beta. It's continuous improvement, perpetual beta. And I need a strategy. A strategy is not just a, a Excel document of fixes. A strategy is over the next two to three years, here's what I'm going to achieve. It's in henna. It's not in ink. And basically that allows me to continue to update it as business priorities change. We live in a world where the business 
priorities and the business goals and objectives change so much faster than ever before that I can't think that I'm going to do the same thing in HR and workforce technology for two to three years and know what it's going to look like ahead of time. I'm going to do mergers, acquisitions, digital transformation. So much stuff's going to happen during two to three years that my strategy needs to be flexible and what I call anti-fragile. Anti-fragile. I like that. Well, talk about Leap Gen and, and kind of how that comes into your henna tattoo and this perpetual beta. So Jessica, Leap, the, the, the word Leap has always meant a lot to me. I have a great, great friend named Steve Farber who wrote a book called The Radical Leap. And The Radical Leap, Leap stands for love, energy, audacity, and proof. So love what you do to generate energy, to do the audacious, and to prove value. So the concept of a radical leap or the leap is really tied to making sure that in order to be successful in this space, I need to love what I do. And as Leap Gen, I want every single one of our consultants that work with our clients to love what they do because that's going to give them energy to do the audacious, which I think is truly needed now, a leap, not a baby step, and that I'm constantly proving value back to the business. So if we take leap, what I'm doing is not doing baby steps, I'm doing a leap to the next generation of work or workforce technology. So the work that we do, Jessica, here at LeapGen, is we want to be coaches to organizations of all shapes and sizes about how do you deal with this ever-changing world of HR and workforce technology, how do you pick the right technology, and then how do you deploy it in a way that, once again, gets you beyond the go-live but gets you in a constant perpetual mode of continuous improvement and saying that go live is the magical moment when I start getting smarter as an organization about my people and my talent. Let's take a reset. This is Jessica Miller Merrill and you're listening to the Workology podcast. Today we're talking about technology ROI with Jason Averbuck. You can connect with Jason on Twitter at Jason Averbuck, J-A-S-O-N-A-V-E-R-B-O-O-K. All right. Let's get back to it. I love our worker centric focus topic. Um, and, and you were kind of leading this direction. HR and workplace leaders, certainly executives of companies, aren't always seen as super innovative and willing to take risks or make change. How do we help drive that level of innovation in our organizations? Yeah, and Jessica, the, the loving what you do, I, I, you know, and I know this sounds a little bit crazy to HR people, but I want. I want the workforce to love the solutions that we put out for them, that we're getting value. The, the term we use always, Jessica, is adoption to addiction. How do I move people from adoption to addiction? Where in the adoption world, they're the ones that are trying to figure out why would I do this here versus call someone. I want to get them addicted to the technology and addicted to the process where, wow, I see so much tremendous value in doing this this way. Why would I ever do it the other way? And I truly think that love component of it is I need to get people to love this model of work. Um, and I think that once again, exactly what you said, millennials, they love you know, the fact that they can do things chatting. They do love that they can do things online without necessarily waiting on hold or talking to someone. And I think that that's going to continue to perpetuate as we move into Gen Z and the world of digital natives becoming what our workforce is made of. Does that mean that we as HR leaders taking this more innovative approach need to focus more on like training and ongoing learning with that 1% or 2% that might not necessarily be ready, but we need to move forward anyway? Yeah. So Jessica, one of the things, if you think about HR and think about HR and innovation together, oftentimes those two butt heads. And, you know, one of the things that I try to infuse into people as we talk through this stuff is... In HR, we're used to doing things for around the 0.01% who might not do things right versus the 99.99% who want to do things right. So instead of putting social collaboration tools online, we say, well, what about if someone does this? Or instead of putting direct access, you know, our term for self-service online, people will say, well, we have 2% of the workforce who's not ready yet. We, we can't live in a world where we have to wait for everyone to move forward. We have to, live, we have to think about it from the world where we need to be leading people forward because we know what's best for the business. We know it's best for the business to have this data, 
for people interacting with tools, interacting with processes, and we're able to make better business decisions based on it versus saying, hey, these guys aren't ready for it. We can't do this yet. That innovation lens has to get embedded into the HR department, not the technology department, within the HR department to say, hey, the rest will catch up. But if we wait till everyone's ready, we'll never do anything. And HR people themselves aren't innately marketing. Although I think we've been doing marketing for a long time, we just haven't thought of ourselves in that uh, perspective. So Jessica, one of the things about marketing is that HR people, A, need to get much better at marketing, both from the standpoint of their branding, but also from a storytelling standpoint. And I'll just talk about real each of them real briefly. So first, from a marketing standpoint, take a look at career brands. People have great career brands. We play ping pong here, we drink beer, you can bring dogs, you can work from home, all that other stuff. And then you get inside the company and you look at their internal brand on their intranet or portal, and it looks like an old-fashioned link farm with just a bunch of links. And I'm always like, what happened to the brand? And they're like, well, that's the brand to, uh, to bring people in. That's not the brand to keep people. And I'm like, guys, it needs to be one brand. So the marketing and branding and how we communicate is so, so important to get people bought in. And I always share with people, with great marketing, okay technology works. Without good marketing, you have to have something from an amazing technology standpoint, otherwise you're gonna get rejection very, very quickly. The other part of marketing, as I was talking about, that's really important is storytelling, which is because I'm dealing with talking to more audiences than ever, I need to think about how to take data that's HR data and communicate that to a business person in their language. And the best way to do that is with stories. So Jessica, I think that overall, the HR function needs to truly take on marketing head on and say, wow, we've got work to do here. This should be one of our core priorities going forward. I agree with all of this, but I, I like the the message that you're you're sending, right? Like it's, it's communicating in, an, in a different way, uh, but definitely needed. Well, and Jessica, back to what you said earlier about consumerization, that one of the key tenets of consumerization is what? Personalization. So if I'm going to personalize something, I need to A, have data so I know that I can personalize, but B, I need to make sure I communicate tied to that person's language. And so often we just send out, here, here's our time to fill. You know, that's HR speak. Here's our effective date. That's HR speak. An effective date to an employee is a kiss at the end of the first date. It's not a field called effective date. We have a lot of work to do in communicating in their language, not just ours. This speaks to getting outside of the HR silo and really thinking about the larger business, getting to know those other senior leaders and operations and sales and logistics, whatever part, and understand where you fit into that bigger picture and how your technology and your processes are going to benefit the larger organization. Yeah, so Jessica, my, this is my favorite topic. And the reason it's one of my favorite topics is because it's usually an easy fix, but it's a framing issue around how I go about fixing it. So many cases when I hear and when I when people, so this almost happens to me every day, someone will send me their quote unquote business case. And I'll look at it. And even before I open it, I'm like, I frame myself, I'm like, is this a business case or is this an HR case? And usually what I see are HR cases, which is how is this going to help HR? How is this going to help HR? How is this going to help HR? Where if I'm really making a business case, I need to say, how is this going to help the business? And to make a business case, I need to say, here are my three to five corporate objectives. Here are my three to five HR objectives. Notice they're aligned. And then here are my HR or workforce technology objectives. Uh, up to stack, top to bottom, corporate, HR, HR and workforce technology. If I'm doing HR and workforce technology things that I can't tie back to the three to five corporate objectives, I'm, I don't have a business case. Like you don't have a business case. So everything you do needs to say, I'm gonna do it with the context of knowing these. And by the way, because people are the most important part of the business, almost always you can make the case if you follow my method I just shared. Objectives tying to HR objectives, tying to HR technology objectives. And basically, if you can't take the work you're doing and tie them to corporate objectives, either A, you shouldn't be doing the work, 
or B, you need help making sure that you can. Because people are the most important part of our business. They're the biggest spend. If I'm working on things that I can't tie to a corporate objective, I'm doing the wrong things. So very, very important as you're making a business case to set up ahead of time, what am I going to be great at as an HR function? What is it okay to be performing at as an HR function? And once I have those things answered, I can make that case. I can make the case. But the framing can't be what's in it for me as an HR department. The framing has to be what's in it for me, what's, excuse me, what's in it for the business for me to be successful with this. Well, I, I love this. And I think this answered my last question, which was other areas that are critical for workforce technology. I mean, it's getting out of your bubble. Yeah, Jimmy, Jessica, I mean, I do a lot of work. In fact, the rest of this week, I'll be doing work on business case with an organization, large organization. And the way we do that is we basically get out of HR. So we spend about 50% of our time meeting with business, the business, not HR. We spend about 30% of our time with HR. We spend about 20% of our time with IT. And based on that, we say, here's the business pain. Here's what HR's pain is. Here's what IT can do from a support standpoint. Now, what's our path forward? If you do that, you're going to have the weight of the business on you, A, and B, they're going to be bought in. So when it comes time to go to your meetings and say, hey, here's my pitch, quote unquote, for spending money, the business has already bought into it. It shouldn't be a surprise to them. It should be their words turned into your action, not your action, hopefully turning into words for them. Once again, moving over to consumerization, like we should be taking a nod from those tools and technologies and sites that that we as consumers love. It's getting out of your bubble and it's also opening your eyes to how you do things, Jessica, in the rest of the world. So you know, people always ask me, they'll say, well, so what should our user interface look like? And I'm like, guys, name your favorite website. I mean, this is a fun exercise, I, at least for me, it's fun, Jessica. Why, you know, shopping on Amazon, people will always say, I'm like, look at Amazon. I've got knowledge about the product. I've got collaboration in the reviews. I've got an analytic, which is people that bought this also bought this. And then I've got the transaction. So I have knowledge, collaboration, analytic, and transaction in one page. Now, in the HR world, how do you roll out knowledge, collaboration, analytic, and transactions to your workforce? Usually it's four pages, four logins, if they can find how to do it. If you take a look at those two examples I just shared there, Amazon and internal to HR, And that gap, Jessica, that's the gap we need to be fixing. Well, Jason, thank you for for joining us. This has been a fun conversation. Where can people go to learn more about you and what you do? Uh, So either follow me on Twitter at Jason Aberbrook or uh, visit our website, www.leapgen.com. We do every couple of weeks really fun live video chats. One of our goals is to educate the community. So we're trying to really make sure that everyone gets this message. So this podcast helps. But you know, every two weeks, how do you keep learning and continuous improve? The leap chats we put out there as well are great. So uh, join those as well. They're free, quote unquote. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it as well. Technology in order to more effectively do our jobs and build our organizations is extremely important. However, painting the picture in terms of the path of how we get there is also important too, as is the ROI and painting the picture for that finish line. It is critical if we want to gain buy-in and help other leaders and partners see the bigger organizational vision, thinking about how HR and recruiting can help. Thank you for joining the Workology podcast, a podcast for the disruptive workplace leader who's tired of the status quo. This is Jessica Miller Merrill. Until next time, you can visit Workology.com to listen to all our previous podcast episodes. Have a great day. Production services for the Workology podcast with Jessica Miller Merrill provided by TotalPicture.com.